first goes over this way more, just slightly. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Hold on, we're not live, are we? <laughs> we may be. We <laughs> oh, <lovely. laughs> oh heavens. okay yes i i we, we could very well be live like right now live yes we're live. lovely we <laughs> are live okay and we got susie's hair going <laughs> all of you people that are here early you got a little treat going okay let's see whoa that's not what i wanted to do hang on we could very well be live like right now ah, okay yes, sorry there we go we're not oh, technical difficulties here, kids. They got this new Facebook um, setup, and it is not the friendliest setup in the world. I must tell you that. It's um, weird. I don't like it. But uh, how is everybody this morning? Very good. Doing great. We would like to welcome our guest star. And I have to say star because she is a star, <laughs> and that would be the fabulous, gorgeous, intelligent and safety-minded Susie Dunkel Soto. Welcome, Susie. Good morning, everybody. Why don't you introduce well, me here? Tell, tell everybody about you in a uh, nutshell. In a nutshell? In a nutshell. Um, I've been a realtor for 10 years and I'm a mother of three. I am um, actually a wife of 33 years. Um, what else is there about me? Um, CAR director, NAR director. I'm the past president, the 2017 past president, the West San Gabriel Valley Association or Realtors. Um, I serve on the planning commission in the city of Alhambra, and I'm also the president of our local chamber of commerce. So it's just a few little things going on. And the grandmother of Gracie. And the grandma Gracie, yes, my sweet angel. Um, <laughs> And actually, the mother of my son, today's is Josh's birthday. Oh, uh, happy birthday, Josh. Wow, happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday to both of you. Mom <laughs> yeah. should celebrate. Birthing day, right? Yes, right? yes. I think we should be having our own personal parties for that. So. <laughs> I'll drink to that later. Actually, we will be. I have Josh wine for him. Well, for me, celebrating him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Along. <laughs> Moving along, yes. Okay, well, we're going to talk about realtor safety today because it is Realtor Safety Month. If you didn't get enough of it last week, well, we're just going to give you like the super duper reader's digest fun realtor safety talk this morning, right? Absolutely. Now, Lori <laughs> has to bug off in a little bit. So we're going to start with Lori. And I put her on the spot because she didn't know until maybe three minutes before we went live. <laughs> It's like, hey, Lori, what should we know from a broker compliance standpoint on safety? Well, it's a wonderful question. You know, it's so important. We, we always talk about transactional risk. And so it's, it's equally important to have safety measures for your agents. You know, we, we all know we're in an industry that we rely on trust. And when we are looking to get business, especially as brand new agents, we are very trusting and we don't always think about the situations we can put ourselves in. And I think I mentioned um, early on in one of our first sessions that as a brand new agent, I didn't recognize that risk. And I was out previewing a vacant house. And as I was leaving, a gentleman you know, got out of his car and said, hey, can I see the house? And I'm thinking, ooh, a live one. Yeah, of course. And let him in. And I stayed at the door. He, he walked around and then we walked out together. Um, but not even for one second did I think that I was in danger, that I was putting myself in a vulnerable position. So we exchanged contact information and left. And then when I looked up his address, discovered it was a PO box address. And then I realized, wow, I, I could have found myself in a situation. So it's something that we have to really talk about with brand new licensees and I'm sure you know all of what Susie's going to cover today is stuff that we should have a safety program within our brokerages. We should have some training, we should have resources, and we should make sure that we have protocols in place so that agents can support one another because we get busy and we don't 
think about what we're doing and our surroundings. And it's a dangerous business. It's a wonderful business, but it can be dangerous. So I'm really looking forward to hearing Susie's content. I do need to jump over to um, Orange County Realtors Rexpo, which is going on because Gov Hutchinson is going to be speaking and I need to make sure I have the latest and greatest, but I'm going to catch the replay because I don't want to miss Susie's content. So thanks for being here. Thank you, Lori. Okay. We'll see you later. Yeah, I'm going to stick on for just a couple minutes, but I'll slowly leave and say goodbye. Okay. So. <laughs> later. Okay. And it is really important to have some sort of uh, office plan put together too. You know, I mean, a lot of different offices do a lot of different things. I know thinking back to previous brokerages that I worked at, you know, they had ideas, but I'm not sure if in today's world, um, you know, picking up the phone saying, hi, can you bring me the yellow file or can you get, you know, can you check something in the red file on my desk? If that's going to really fly with somebody, I mean, it's a way to, to get the word out that it's like, I'm in trouble, somebody help me. But, um, you know, it's, I think it's something that the brokerages need to keep fresh with, you know, technology, see if there's different things out there that can help them. Susie, do you know of anything like that? Any good tech apps, anything? Well, I mean, I, I personally have not been one to lean to the tech apps. I mean, I will take, if I'm going on a, a showing several homes of somebody that I'm just kind of a newer, um, a newer client, then I would text my husband addresses and I will be going to and just kind of, okay, I'm, at, I'm here headed to uh, destination C and then heading to D. Um, but I personally have not relied on um, my phone, whether someone's not on the other end um, to receive my messages of distress um, or my phone is taken from my hands or at open house if I've left it in, in the kitchen when I'm, someone's coming to the front door. So I mean, my personal, my personal defense is my body. So it's going to be hard here to kind of show a few, um, uh, a little bit of that. But it's, you know, when someone's grabbing your arm, the element of surprise and kind of stepping into them and just different um, pushing away or kind of fanning to get your hand away from them. Um, your, your, was it palm of your hand <laughs> to someone's to someone's nose um, is really going to hurt your knee to growing if it's a male or a female will take someone down um, kicking in the knees so I mean my but again that's my personal choice um, I think and those are just kind of like so we can talk a little bit more about some of the the options um, to use but. For an app, I really have not relied on an app only because I don't want that false sense of security. Mm -hmm. um, I put on my location. So, but if my phone is left at a home and I'm not there, that's not going to help anybody find me. So I, I've always found that that to me was a false sense of security for myself. And I know there's a lot of safety apps that are out there. Um, I think the first um, line of defense um, and I know it's on realtor.org and realtor safety. There's a lot of um, like uh, entry forms or screening forms for the brokers. And Lori, I don't know if this is something that you work with and in, in, um, with some of the brokers as to, you know, an intake sheet. But honestly, I've never completed in, an intake sheet, getting the information. So- Rely on the information being accurate anyway. Right. Yeah, if somebody's um, coming in to do you harm, why would they leave valid information? Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's um there's a site I just um went on to truepeoplesearch.com and you can put a name or even a phone number. And I put in my phone number, all of my it shows my home address, my prior work address is, it shows my family. So you're kind of able to say, oh yeah, that's who they say they are. You put in a phone number like my daughter is hidden i put her name shows up but there's no information for her so um there's a way to to block and protect yourself but to me it's like okay as as realtors we want to, to protect ourselves um but if a client gives you a phone number you go and search and it kind of leads you to a dead end 
with that phone number blocked, you don't have a little like, who is this person? Um, I, I just think the, the truepeoplesearch.com is a good quick way to find out is somebody who they say, does their name match their phone number? Um, that's one quick, easy way. I've had where um, somebody's called and wanted me to show a listing and I've requested a proof of funds and, oh, I'm a cash buyer. Okay, great. Can you send me a copy of your ID? No, I'm not sending my ID. You don't get to do that. I was like, well, you know who I am. I don't know who you are. And um, it just gets a little heat and escalate. It's like, next, you know, it, your, your safety is not worth that commission. And it's really hard when we're unemployed every day until we actually close escrow and receive a paycheck. So exactly. some people are employed more frequently than others are employed. So, but chasing that commission um, or just trying to really service our clients. You know, you have somebody who wants to, to see the property, you want to be able to close it in, you know, within your 30 days, 60 days. Um, you know, we're quick to, to kind of put our safety aside. One of the, um, I became a realtor in 2010 and 2014 is when Beverly Carter um, was assaulted and told her husband she was going to go show, show her listing. Um, fast forward, the guy and the girlfriend, uh, well, the husband gets to her, the showing her listing, sees a car in a purse in the driveway and she's nowhere to be found. So it's kind of a, I mean, there's a lot more details in um, going into it, but um, unfortunately she did not. Um, they found her body in a shallow grave the next day or a day or two later. Um, but he said he had followed her because he knew she would. She was a loan um, broker and she was very wealthy in his eyes. And, you know, as realtors, we portray this image, the cars, where we live, our, our photos, you know, there's so much that goes on that we, there's this perception that we're easy targets um, hosting open houses alone. So it's, um, you know, always having, uh, actually I would say that one of the first line of defenses would to be have somebody with you at an open house, um, safety and numbers is, um, you know, I would always ask, I always ask a lender to join me in open house. And um, I'm not a lender, I'm not gonna quote, I'm not gonna be qualified, so to have a lender there on site has one um, extra safety there. I had an open house and here in the motorcycle park out, outside and in walks this like six foot five man with his glasses on, his bandana and he walks in and he's like, are you Susie? I'm like, and I looked at the lender who's probably half my size and I was like, oh man, I picked the wrong help today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But it was like, you know, how many bedrooms? And it's like, oh, I wish I had had a gun on me to say, there's two bedrooms up there. I'll be here waiting <laughs> for you. Like, um, and it, it was fine, but there's that, it was that reminder to me of, you know, that safety team. And, you know, after he left, it was like, we went through our safety plan, which should have been um, done mutually to let her know why I was having her there, not just to help her get business, but it was a safety in numbers. Well, and you touched on something really important uh, that the, the Beverly Carter situation um, about the perception of money and, and, you know, fancy car or whatever. And I think a lot of people really need to think long and hard about what kind of presence that they're putting out there as an agent. Um, and this goes both ways, men and women, you know, mm -hmm. the, the men can get assaulted just as easily as women can. And if you're Actually, out there, one in three assaults on a realtor is a male. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they're walking around with a fancy watch and, you know, driving the fancy car and all of that stuff. And, you know, who's, who's to say that they're not saying, eh, I kind of like that watch. I'll just clock the guy and take it and then drive off in his white BMW, you know? So, I mean, we have to kind of watch, what we post out there is kind of interesting, I think, right now in the, in the COVID environment. It really doesn't matter what the heck you're driving or what kind of watch you've got, uh, you know, because this is how we're interacting. We're, you know, and, and we have to kind of remember the safety aspect on that too, because we may not be out doing open houses, but we're still out showing property and we can get a PED form signed by somebody. But again, do we really know 
who they are. And I am seeing more of the looky loos coming out now and the people that don't want to tell you, you know, how they're going to pay for something. Um, I, have you noticed that as well? Uh, yes. They don't want to. And one of my requirements, which I think COVID has really said, if we can keep some of these practices in place, um, and it's, I just tell any buyer, I need to provide um, proof of funds and um, uh, pre-approval. Just so you're qualified before going in, because the sellers don't want to just open up their home to anybody now. And, and that was kind of the case prior, but this kind of helps us put that in place, that little extra step. That's a great tip. And, and I just want to remind everybody to, if you implement something like that, be consistent, require it of every person so that you are not, a, you are not at risk of being perceived as discriminating. Right. You're going to ask for it. Great. Ask for it from everybody. Yep. Not just the ones you think you need to ask for. Everybody. Yeah. And yeah. it's important for the agents to understand if somebody, the listing agent is asking for that. You know, I, I got a lot of pushback, especially when it first started up with, you don't need to see that. You don't need to see that. And I think now it's getting to be a little bit more well accepted. And oh it's still, you know, agents realize we, why we're doing this. And I personally do think it's a good practice. I mean, this is what they do on the, in the luxury market. I mean, when you're walking into somebody's $10 million house, they don't just want people traipsing through that have absolutely no ability to purchase a home whatsoever. And we're in that same situation here as realtors yeah. now showing any property. Right. Yeah, I had a client before and it was a referral of, someone's a friend's son's friend and he was would send me bank statement showing he had 40 million and he was some like silicon valley like it and he'd show proof of funds but everything had been photoshopped and two months in of showing multi-million luxury homes and it was interesting because i would have a listing agent say we can't find this guy anywhere and i'm like what are you looking at my client for like this is legit and it was something that I practice, but you know, when you call for proof of funds, no one's gonna say, oh yeah, they have this much cash. And when I would ask for a letter from, from the bank, would always provide a letter, but it was a letter that the buyer was doctoring up and sending to me. So it was really um, an interesting eye opener on how you move forward um, with any client. Because, and it was just this, we talked about safety as in safety of our, our beings, our bodies, but there's also the safety of um, cyber safety, our clients' data um, being protected. So uh, th there's just, in the whole realtor safety, there's a lot that goes into it. And now adding into it, the whole COVID safety plays in with it. We have all kinds of safety issues that we have to uh, work on. Don't worry, my gardener is probably going to show up in a minute too. So. <laughs> But there is, you know, one, one thing that is a great teacher, unfortunately, is when you go through a situation like, you know, um, what you went through with the, the fraudulent buyer, and I went through a, um, a wire fraud situation that thank mm -hmm. God, you know, thank God you were okay on yours professionally, and thank God I was okay on mine. And I think a lot of it goes from just knowledge. You hear these stories, and... You need to understand this could happen to you. That was the only thing that saved me on the wire fraud was I had heard Lori and another um, uh, operating officer from a relatively large company it's back when Lori was in a corporate position and they were talking about, you know, oh, this, you know, this wire fraud thing happened that, you know, somebody lost $2 million over at this brokerage or whatever. And I'm sitting there going, wow what are you guys talking about? You know, cause I'm a realtor on the street. I'm not doing corporate stuff, you know, I'm out here in the real world. And they said, oh, well, you know, there's this thing with wire fraud where they're getting, you know, bad wiring instructions and all this. I'm like, wow, you know, tell me more. Cause I haven't heard anything about it. This was going on at the high level brokerage but nobody was talking about it because nobody wants to say my company just lost $2 million of one of our clients money. But I asked them and they, they explained to me what was happening. And it's like, wow, okay. And thank God 
I was sitting there during that conversation because one of my clients had received phony wiring instructions after my email account mm -hmm. got hacked. And it was my email account that got hacked because the um, hackers who are very sophisticated, they're not you know, some fat guy sitting in the basement. They're actually, you know, most of them are in Russia um, mm -hmm. sitting around. The, the Russian army is basically bombs and laptop computers. And they will get into your email one way or another. You don't know if that DocuSign thing that you couldn't figure out why you got the DocuSign link. Um, that could be a phishing scam right there. You, you accept it, boom, they are all over your email. And what had happened was they saw something coming in regarding um, getting ready for the um, wire transfer. And then basically, I don't wanna say took over my account, but started conversing with my client. He exchanged seven messages with that person saying that they were me all day long until they built the trust with him. And then they're like, oh, you know, last minute change. Um, you know, here's the wiring instructions and send it to him. And thank God he, his um, credit union, which was the United States Senate Federal Credit Union, <laughs> um, is on the East Coast in DC. He initiated the wire past the cutoff time. It was like 3.30 our time right before they closed. And so the wire didn't go out that day. And then he hung up the phone and said, oh my God, I think I just did what Lisa told me not to do. And he's like, Lisa, did you send me wiring instructions today? I'm like, I would never send you wiring instructions. Like, oh my God, did you get wiring instructions? And he says, I just sent $98,000 to wherever. And I told him, you know, get a hold of somebody. He's like, it's after hours. And I'm like, do you have a credit card or a debit card? you know, with the fraud line on it. And he's like, yes. And I said, get on the phone with them immediately. Tell them what happened. And he did. And they were able to stop the wire. But if I had not gone through that, I would never really have taken it as seriously as I take it now. And I passed the word because again, at that time, nobody was talking about it. I, I shared it with the marketing meeting and everybody's jaws just hit the floor because us on the street, didn't know it was happening. No, I think it was a lot of the escrow companies that started to bring it to the attention of all the realtors. And your client was lucky because my understanding is um, the first 24 hours is the most critical after 48, typically trying to get that money back. Yeah. And we were and hearing people that had received money, sold their home, went to wire somewhere else, and they were left, couldn't find their new house, and they've lost their old house. And yeah. we're ending up like- And they oh, lost their money on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's bad. And there's still escrow companies that are doing this. So if you are dealing with an escrow company that's sending you the wiring instructions, number one, tell them to stop it because they, they by now they should know better because my, my situation happened years ago. But um, one other thing that I just found out recently that I wish I knew that if you're dealing with California escrow, the wiring instructions are always going to be to a bank in California. And the wiring instructions that my client had were to Bank of America in Atlanta, Georgia. And right there, if I had known or if he had known, that would have been the tip off saying, hey, they're not in California. So now I always tell my clients, when do you get those uh, wiring instructions, which they're going to confirm or maybe leave some of the information off so you have to physically talk to the um, escrow officer, just double check where that bank is, just so you know, because these hackers have been known to get on the phone and say they're so-and-so at such and such escrow. So, you know, you gotta kind of have to understand they're as smart, if not smarter than we are, but knowledge is power and can keep you from losing your client's money. Yeah, very scary. And, and but that goes into it um, with the whole safety. If our, our, um, computers are being hacked into and and they're receiving that information it's it's damaging to you to the industry our clients it's it's um so i really like that that nar has incorporated the whole realtor safety encompassing there's so much that goes into it 
Yeah, because there, there is a lot of safety that we do have to be aware of. And it's, uh, you know, right now we're in such a shift that um, there's going to be a lot more fraud. In fact, I mm -hmm. hopefully in the next week or so, I'm going to get um, a friend from a title company to come and speak about the increase in fraud that they're seeing. And it's because people have time on their hands. <laughs> Can, they're they're getting a little and bit more new resources to make money new uh, resource getting resourceful on ways to make money unfortunately exactly. yeah and it's and it's beyond the wire fraud it's it's people writing fraudulent contracts and various other things you know kind of like the situation that you had but um, we'll get him to join us in the next week or two and kind of hear the latest and greatest because I was shocked you know when I'm like hey so what's new and it's like increase in fraud and I'm like what so. You know, wow. it's really kind of amazing. But let's go back to, you know, we're not doing the open houses too much. And uh, Inez put in a good remark here saying when we should always use the words join us instead of join me when posting on social media, mm -hmm. which is very smart. And for, you know, since we're not really doing open houses per se anymore, um, but hopefully we'll be. be doing them soon, <laughs> um, kind of, hopefully. Um, Let's say, let's say this, because this is more or less a true story. It didn't happen to me, thank God. But there was a realtor in Laguna Niguel, in a very nice neighborhood of Laguna Niguel here in Orange County, um, you know, multi-million dollar homes. And she was putting a lockbox on a water pipe for people to access her listing that was hitting the market that day. She was by herself. Because all she's doing is putting a lockbox on the house. Somebody comes up from behind, grabs her around the neck, and proceeds to start choking her. We're talking broad daylight on a Saturday afternoon in a very good neighborhood. And she was trying to fight back. Uh, she was able to get her breath and scream a couple of times. And some gardeners came, you know, from, you know, a different area and the guy let go and ran off, but he was like loose in a regional park for three days while they were trying to track him down. Wow. So if you were sitting there and putting your little lockbox on and somebody comes up behind you, grabs you around the neck, what would you do? What, what would be the body thing to do? Well, it's hard to kind of do it <laughs> here with myself, but again, it's, you know, it's grabbing on to try to get some, some break. Um, and I mean, if they're right behind you, it's really hard to get an elbow upwards to be able to kind of bend back. But when you, if they're holding you and you fall back into them or step into them, um, it's that element of surprise of instead of pulling, but the, they're anticipating that you're going to pull. Um, so when you're going back into them and try to get maybe some pressure off some way to twist, um, but there's, we'll need to do a self an actual self-defense talk of the instructor here with us and, and show some, some quick little moves. But that is, um, it really is hard when you get into some positions that you just can't break from. And uh, one of the, the big things I've learned is the whole element of surprise. And that's kind of either stepping into them if they're pulling you um, or if they're behind you, kind of going back and, and finding some way, utilizing your your elbows with that. So something kind of count, counterintuitive to what they're expecting. They're, they're expecting you to try to get away. So if you basically lean into, lean into it, then- Lean into them to oh, turn or something. Because yeah. that's you still want to be able to, to catch your breath. You don't want to be um, taken out. But I mean, so let's say someone has a gun on you. They say you have a gun, they have, you know, follow them. They've got a gun, they got a knife, you know, to submit and to follow. You know, at this point, there's a chance you're not going to survive. So you're going to fight for your life. And if that means going with them and following with and trying to plan your escape at that point, um, you know, if someone has a weapon, it, it's really a, a, a tough call of what you're going to do. But you need to kind of commit to what you're going to do. Um, it, I mean, it. That whole, when you're just caught off completely off the price. When someone's walking to your open house, you're kind of on guard expecting that. But that's, you know, a big thing. Oh gosh, I can't, 
it's there's a 10 second rule and it's take when you get out of your car take two seconds to look around then there's like two seconds um or before you get out of your car when you get out of your car look where you parked so you're going, going into it and it it's going through two seconds of five different steps of being aware of your surroundings and what's going on um now if this person is hiding in behind the bushes behind a wall and you don't see them then you're you know you're just you're cut off um little and, and to the to that realtor the numbers aren't going to matter much but 90 percent of the perpetrators are somebody you know um the, the boogeyman coming to get you is a very small number um but to her that's a huge number because that boogeyman came out and jumped up so it is uh you know it's fight and flight. Yeah, and situational awareness is so important. Um, <laughs> I was just sitting here thinking how odd it was a couple of years ago, we were talking about how to get away from mass shooters. Okay. And I guess one good thing about COVID is, well, we haven't had any mass shootings lately, but I shouldn't say anything, knock on wood, because, hey, you know, we still got a couple of months left of 2020. Anything can happen. But one of the <laughs> things... One of the things that, you know, that um, we would hear is whenever you walk into uh, an office building or a shopping mall to always look besides the way that you came in to other exits that you can, you know, utilize in the event something happens. And the same thing, you need to think about that when you're in an open house or when you're showing a property, you know, you always want to be the one behind the people that you're showing the house. Like when you're going upstairs, you don't want to be the one leading the way. You want to be up here after you and let them go. And I would go one step further on the stairs, let them go and say, I want you to experience on your own. I, on your own. I was here, I saw the house. Go ahead. Because if you don't know who this person is, and even if you do know it's a new client, maybe you've been groomed and to trust this person. And, um, or they've done the grooming on you. Now you're upstairs, you're in an area you can't get away. So, I mean, for me, if safety, I always just go ahead, look at it. I've been here. Let me know what you, if you have any questions. I'll be here waiting, um, especially during an open house. But I mean, that's just, you're right. Let them go ahead of you. Let them go first. Yeah. And, and whether you're touring the house, even, you know, single story, always you stay behind and, you know, always, I always, try to park myself by the door, you know, somewhere <laughs> relatively close to the front door. Yep. Um, you know, I know a lot of times we get in the kitchen and say, okay, the kitchen's, you know, where you usually end up anyhow, but you know, you just want to be able to say, I have a way out mm -hmm. and, and really it doesn't matter who, you know, who it is. You never, I mean, this is going to sound really horrible, but I'm going to say it anyhow. You never know when like, Oh, one of your clients, clients, you know, have, his wife couldn't make it. They've already, you know, you've already shown the couple, you know, six, seven, eight different times, but now the wife couldn't make it. It's just a husband. And you're like, oh, it's Mr. So-so. We'll be fine. Well, what if Mr. So-and-so has been waiting to, mm -hmm. for you to show the home and boom, you know, you've already had this big wall of trust you know that has you know, been built and now it's like i'm going to take advantage of the situation mm -hmm. you know and you never know when that's going to happen you never know you know who who could be hiding in a house too knowing that you're coming you know i've had enough weird things <laughs> with, you know you're like okay well i'm going to be there between 1 and 1 30 which is a pretty specific period of time you get the okay and you walk in and you hear somebody's in it's like, why would somebody take a shower during the time that I told them I was coming? You know, and maybe they're not in the shower. Maybe they're just hanging out, waiting for something funky to happen. I don't know. It's, I mean, we've heard, uh, especially from the, um, in the, uh, like, I, I became a realtor in 2010. And what I was walking into foreclosure homes, the, squatters um it was a very scary situation walking in it's like the windows open mm, there's 
blankets and fast food trash on the floor. Like what's going on? And, and just some very scary when you know it's a vacant property and somebody is truly living there. Like, oh, there's the fresh water in there. It's it just, I remember hearing from another client um, or a colleague, excuse me, in the Pasadena area. And she had gone to show a condo in a neighboring city and the client wasn't thrilled, left. Two hours later, she received a phone call from the police and asking um, what she knew about this property. And she's like, oh, you know, my clients really weren't interested in it. What's going on, officer? And they said um, the listing agent spot had been raped and murdered and was in the closet. And so they were trying to get a track from all the car, realtor cards that were left there of what they had seen. And I was freaked out opening closets before that. And now I'm even more freaked out opening a closet on the big, like who, well, first is someone in there and two, what may you find in there? And so on vacant homes, I'm like, mm, okay, looks like a big closet. I don't want to open the closet mm -hmm. and see what's in there. No, no, no. Um, so there's uh, you know, but it, there's just these situations that you hear of and yeah, they freak you out. But I think we need to learn from them and just take that extra step of precaution. You know, I bring my husband with me to go and look at the home. And even he's going to sit out in the car while I go in and check out a property before I go and show a client. Um, just to have that little safety because you don't know who's going to be around there. You know, the you always go through, open the back door or even lock the front door as you're closing up from open houses because you don't know who may be left in the house. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these stories that we've been hearing for so long of, of safety um, to take. But at an open house, you don't have the safety of screening a client. No, you don't. You're sitting here saying, hey, strangers, come on in, you know. And, and I have like a love-hate relationship with those open houses because like right now, it's like, okay, we can't do them. I don't want to do them. You know, I'm still, I'm still running a seven and a half on the COVID scale. You know, I'm not yeah. out here saying, you know. Can I just be out just to be out? No, you know, people can find me on social media or whatever. But um, it used to always bother me late, late in the afternoon when you're getting ready to close up and you get that one last person wanting to run through and you're just like, oh my God, you know? And I, I look back at, especially the years when I first got started because I was working in um, a new home track is how I got started. And I would be there by myself with three houses to lock up and I just look and say oh my god you know thank god I knew people in that neighborhood across the street from the models because you know that was I was doing some pretty silly stuff back in the day but you know I still find myself every now and then saying, oh man I shouldn't have done that and you know another situation especially I think you would find this more in areas where you have an increase in the homeless population um, a lot of them are coming into vacant homes and I'll relay a story. My son will probably kill me for relaying this, but he does um, uh, real estate in the Santa Monica, Venice area. And when he was at his previous company, right before uh, he switched, he was asked, he was a listing coordinator. He would have to go get the properties ready for the you know, agents to show and, and various other things. And he walked into the garage of this one home in Venice and opened the door, you know, because he's just making sure everything was fine, opened the door and there's this naked woman standing there cooking on a camp stove in the garage of the home. <laughs> and he's like, oh, uh, what, uh, who, who and why and what? And, and she's just like, uh, I just wanted breakfast. And he's like, just go put something on <laughs> and you know he, he called the police to have him come out and make sure she was gone but she she had this down she was just finding vacant homes where she could either get inside get in the garage kind of be worried about those garages out there you know and and this really I, I can't really say that it's mainly in areas that have a lot of homeless people because we are seeing an increase in you know homeless unfortunately homeless people coming into areas where they wouldn't normally go before and they're going to be looking for places to stay as well so always when you're walking into a vacant don't assume it's always going to be vacant right because boy yeah. that's a little shock to his system 
Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. And um, I was. Oh, oh, I was um did a, an open house last year, and I had another realtor because I couldn't get a lender to they just weren't available to join me on that day. I had um, another realtor that um, just, you know, anything comes in, it's yours. Buyers, listeners, listings are yours. Just be there for me. And um, after putting up the directional open house signs, I get to the, the front, the gate to open up, and there's this gentleman standing there. And it's like, oh, well, how are you? He goes, I was watching you put up all the signs. You look great in orange. <laughs> it just looks like, um, well, thank you. Were you interested in, um, so it's kind of how he found out about the open house. And I look over and Tanner was doing open house with me. And I look over and he sees this look of like concern. Um, so I had Tanner kind of lead and, and go and I'm like, kind of set, finishing up outside. The guy doesn't want to talk to Tanner. He just wants to talk to me, wants me to sell his home. Um, and then interested in this and come to my house after I want, so you can look at it, give me an estimate. I said, Tanner and I can make an appointment and it would just that uneasiness. Um, he's like, well, I want you to sell it. And I said, Tanner and I together. Well, he wasn't interested in that. That wasn't what he wanted. Um, but he had given me his card. His email was twinklesock69. That was an alarm. <laughs> so Tanner was all like Googling this guy's name and that he was legit. We both drove by his, his, what was his home after. And there were just all these flags that was legit, but just a lot of concerns, alerts, something was off um, in this. And, you know, it's the safety of having somebody there with you because you're walking into, my client's, the house is occupied, but it was vacant that weekend. So what were we walking into? Who's following you in, knowing that there's nobody, there's no cars. So, you know, you're, even when it's not just a, an empty vacant property and someone's going to be cooking naked and they, people are watching the properties and what we could be walking into. Exactly. And they're watching us. And I honestly think it's a really good idea too, if, you know, you are having to hold open house on your own um, and, you know, other people that are too, you know, having somebody go and just check in on you. Number one, it's always nice for, let me see, what, what is that term Lori used at once? A comfort break. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just to give somebody just a break for a minute, but also just check on them and make sure they're okay. And I was relaying the story to you uh, that was, you know, still to this day, it really kind of shook me to the core um, about somebody that was holding an open house uh, by themselves in a very safe neighborhood. Again, you know, there shouldn't be any problems in this neighborhood. And I was meeting my clients there. And I noticed there was a car parked about a house length away from mine. And there was just a gentleman sitting in it. He wasn't getting out of the car. And I thought, well, this is odd. Why would you pull up to an open house and not get out of your car? Says the woman who's sitting in her car. <laughs> but I, you know, I thought about it. I said, you know what? This is kind of weirding me out a little bit. I, you know, my clients are going to be here. Um, I'm just going to go into the house, go check it out. And so I go into the house and then the man gets out of the car and he goes into the house too. And then my clients pull up and my clients, you know, come into the house. So we're all kind of getting in there all at about the same time. And the gentleman kind of followed us through the property and it turned out later that the agent told me that she thought he was with me because of the way we were kind of grouped together and so you know my clients tour the house and I'm like looking at this guy going something ain't right here and I told my clients you know what go ahead and go on to the next house if I need you I'll call you you know where I am and the husband's like, well, do you want me to stay here? And I'm like, they've got little kids with them. And I'm like, you know, just don't worry. I know where you're going to be. You know where I am. If I need you, I'll text you. And so I stayed and the agent's like, is that guy with you? And I'm like, no, but I'm not going to leave until he leaves. And my clients are fine. And the gentleman comes in and I looked at him and I'm like, he looks familiar. And I couldn't quite figure out where I knew him from. And then it hit me. It's like, Oh crap, he was one of the dads. He was like the crazy dad on one of my son's uh, soccer teams years, years ago. And I'm like, wow, that's just crazy, you know? 
comes in, he starts talking to the agent and starts getting real weird with her. And is like, well, why'd you price a house like this? You know, another house sold for more money down the street. You know, I think you're trying to ruin our neighborhood. You're underpricing the homes. You know, I'm going to take a hit on my equity. And he raised his voice and was yelling at her and just saying all kinds of just wackadoo stuff. And I'm like, okay, I am certainly not leaving. And I'm getting ready to hit the one on 911 if this keeps going. And, you know, then he looks at me and he's like, hey, don't I know you? And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know, you look awfully familiar, but I can't place it either, which I don't know whether that helped or hurt because he didn't know who I was, but I knew who he was. So if something really went haywire, at least I could tell the cops who he was. Um, but he just kept, you know, escalating it, escalating it, and finally ran out of steam and walked out the door. And the, the other agent was just like, oh, my God, thank you for staying with me. I don't know what I would have done. Mm. And, you know, so it's one of those things that if you are walking into a listing and the other agent is just acting a little off, yeah, check in with them, make sure they're okay. Even if it's like at a, you know, a, a COVID showing or something, you know, if they, if they just don't look right, go with your gut and ask them, is there anything I can help you with? I won't leave you alone if you don't want to be left, you know, if you want somebody here with you, I'll stay. And, uh, you know, I think that that's something we need to understand. We have to look out for each other, even if we're, you know, competitors or whatever, we're still the realtor family and we do have to take care of our own and helping them in situations is one way that we can do that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned something about calling 911. And I think um, if you call 911 from your cell phone, that's going to connect you to the highway patrol. And so if you're going to call, I always try to make an effort to get the local police phone number. Um, just so I, that's the number I would call. But a lot of times you're like dialing area code and you're dialing the 10 numbers. Or when you call 911, give the address for, of the location first before, in case your phone's taken from you. Um, but that was something always um, that I was surprised that because they have locators on our phones. But nine will, it's going to highway patrol by the time they transfer, find ping you. If there's this precious life um, during that, but in a situation like that, you could hit 911 while you're watching a situation go on. But it's always if you're going to call 911, give the address of your location first, um, and then whatever the situation. So at least they have some place to to catch, kind of find where the situation's happening. Um, That's good advice because I wouldn't have thought of that at all. Any other yeah, little really, gems? <laughs> any other little gems? <laughs> um, I just think it's really important that you know, as we're all here as a wrapping up, um, you know, we're here uh, trying to get that commission. Um, you know, not trying to interfere a client. Trying to, um, we don't want to lose the sale. So a lot of times we're just putting our instincts, it's amazing, trust your instincts. If something's not right, there's a good chance something's about to go down. Your instinct, your intuition, your gut feeling is a huge, your huge self um, first line of defense um, to kind of put you in whatever, in preparing your, your body for what you're about to go through. Um, and the fact that 90% of the people we know of the perpetrators or somebody you know is another huge number. Just to be aware, you know, we see that it was the teacher, it was this person. Um, even with the, when I came in at the crash of the market last time, and there were a lot of the, the realtor homicides um, were, as you're kind of saying, you know, people that were upset, they were losing their homes. No, it's your friend. <laughs> People that were losing their homes, they're going through divorce, now that they're where the money was going. House and sell. Um, in a short sell, they lost it before it sold. Um, and then realtors were being blamed and the realtors were being assaulted, um, murdered. I mean, it was just a really ugly time. Um, 
there's just a number I have, and it was the only number that um, was presented to me. In from 1982 to 2000, 206 agents, realtors, died as a result of violent assault. Wow. And so that's what an eight year. No. <laughs> it's not it's not three percent so we don't know how to calculate it is that right what is it what's the three percent commission i don't know what that is okay <laughs> right um but it just you know i had heard at one point at um one of our cr conferences in uh i don't know risk manager there was a police officer that came and spoke and said the realtors have the second highest homicides to police officers and, and I'm really hoping that those numbers are decreasing from the awareness and different precautions that have been in place. Um, you know, it's something we just, safety first. Your, your commission is not worth your life. And um, it, it's keeping that trust with your clients, um, but keeping your, your, your safety top of mind. And no matter um, as your priority. Well, and there's a good remark here that Inez put in. She said, you know, I walk with my car key in hand with my, um, you know, your finger to press the car alarm in case something happens, you know, the, mm -hmm. at least you can make your car alarm go off. Yeah. And then, you know, at, at a point, you know, she says at a point, a neighbor will get annoyed that your car is going off and come to your open house. So, you know, that's a great idea. And also I put magnets on my car only during open houses so they know where to find me. Car plus sign equals how to find me. And then she says that she's a little on the paranoid side. But, you know, I, I agree with, you know, I'm not a big fan of the car signs myself, but it's just kind of like, hi, if you want to know how to find me, this is, this is my car. And, you know, yeah, um, normal people don't drive around with their phone number on the side of the car, but. We have followed, I mean, when, a lot of times they've said when they have found somebody um, who has attacked a realtor, they'll go in and find that they've got like postcards and pictures, like they've been tracking and following certain realtors. And it's really hard because we are out there in the public. I can type in Lisa Dunn, realtor, and I can find out someone three of about us. you. <laughs> <All> <laughs> Wow, I didn't think such a cool one. One in Minnesota, one in Long Beach, and, and right here. <laughs> I better work on my, my SEO, just to be sure I'll be the first one that you find. <laughs> right, right. Um, but, so they're going to find a lot of, well, at least you'll be able to send them off on different tracks. They won't know you. exactly where to find you. Yeah. Um, but it is, you know, it's, you know, when we put ourselves out there, you know, for the men on their business card in front of, whether it's their Ferrari or someone else's, you know, it's portraying this image. Um, a lot of the assaults start as, um, the crime start as a uh, robbery and will escalate to um, whether it's rape or, and or murder. Um, but it's really something that don't wear the jewelry to kind of diffuse that. Don't, you know, you're there to sell your personality and your professionalism and your experience. Um, and you, know, you do uh, have to really think when you're going for your work, should be professionally. A few people a little carried away. My internet connections getting unstable. bumping so in and out here. Yes, if I freeze, I'm sorry. Probably because I talk about <laughs> what, the, you know, what you shouldn't wear. Um, but, you know, if you're a gal, like, you know, show off certain areas or whatever. Leave the girls you know, at home. Yeah, just, yeah. And, and remember, you know, what was that meme that they had going for like LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Tinder? You're not going for your Tinder photo. You're really even not going for your Instagram photo. Stick with the LinkedIn mindset because... You know, you don't need you don't need that to go out and do your job, and and people really need to think about that because it's you know it's not like well you're asking for it, but it's like you said somebody just may become infatuated with you, 
saving all of the postcards and all or whatever. Um, don't don't give them any real reason to, you know, say, well, you were dressed like that, honey. So, you know, uh, that that can be a, a you know, this is business. We're not we're not Victoria's Secret models. Thank God, you know, that wouldn't work here. Um, but you know, you don't really need to go there for for your your pictures and what you put out there. And um, you know, I, I'm kind of liking this aspect of the the pandemic, though, just because we're not out there so much. And when we are out there, we're really not dressing like we used to. You know, I'm seeing the normal normal realtor nowadays in flip flops and jeans. And were you watching me yesterday? Uh, yeah, it takes one to know one, right? <laughs> and maybe there's a little something to that, you know, that if we kind of get over our bad selves, because of the fact that we're doing Zoom meetings and various other things, you know, maybe we don't have to go out with all of the, the bling or whatever, to, you know, people already know us by the time that they're getting out there because we've been connecting this way, which is probably a good way to meet with your clients before you meet them at a property. You know, we're not putting them in our cars anymore, thank God. So that's a good thing. Um, most of us are working from home and working on Zoom. So that's a good thing. So we can't get lulled into a false sense of security, though, because we do still have to go out into the real world. And speaking of the real world, uh, Nick, everybody's favorite Nick Baldry, uh, he, has a, he has a good point here. He says, has CAR issued any recent recommendations on safety near wildfires? I'm seeing active listings in areas with evacuation warnings near the Bobcat fire. In some of these areas, the city has asked non-residents to stay away to make sure roads aren't clogged up in case residents need to leave at short notice. Should listings in these areas be on hold? Uh, you know what? I haven't heard anything. And where is Lori when you need her? But, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, I would think if you're in an area that's on the evacuation watch, I don't think it's prudent to be having your home available for showings um, because you're not there. You've left because you've got somebody coming to show your home and then you've got strangers in your home and you, you do have that extra traffic. Um, you know, I can say knock on wood, I've never actually have been in evacuation orders before. So I, I've never been through that. I've been self self evacuate planning before i don't think i want people in my house if the air, area is burning what do you think susie i would probably you know like take rec nick's recommendation and put it on hold but put in the comments as to why it's on hold mm -hmm. you know hold for until you know the evacuate conditions are lifted um you know it might be in here a week or two weeks but i agree 100 percent. you can't have um, traffic going in, and, and, and that goes along with endangering your clients, your um, any potential buyers, and for that, the neighbors, because you do need to leave the roads open. The purpose of the evacuations is your safety, but also to allow the emergency vehicles to have access where they need to. Um, you know, that would be interesting, Nick, to, to go on and see if that is, if there is something in place, or even with the MLS, um, how that can be maybe just a reminder to people if your listings in an evacuation area or um, throughout, gosh, the whole West Coast right now, um, before it's California, um, you know, if it is, you know, just kind of note why it's on hold and, and to check back so you don't lose it. But I'm sure, you, I think you would gain a lot of respect from your clients and from your colleagues in doing that, respecting. And as long as it's truly often someone's not trying to, to sell it off market at that point. Yeah. No point. Well, and it might you know, be a good point to it. bring up with your local board too, you know, because we're all kind of in the same boat. You know, if you're, if your area is actively under an ev evacuation orders or close to, or a watch or whatever, you know, I think that there's a point where agents kind of need to step it up too and just say, hey, this may not be the best thing. Maybe we can all kind of agree, you know, or, you know, talk to the offices and different brokerages, you know, it's like, is it in every, anybody or everybody's best interest to be marketing houses here? Also too, I don't know how you're gonna get fire insurance. You know, it's gonna I, be a tough one. It's gonna be a real, if, if the house is in an area 
under evacuation watch. Do you think the insurance companies don't know that? So you may not be able to close the transaction on that house for a while too. You know, you may want to talk to your insurance um, providers to see what their recommendations are for that particular property. And, you know, if it's your listing, you may not be able to sell it anyhow if you can't get insurance on it. So just a little something to think about. Interesting point, yeah. Anyhow, it's 1101. I'm so happy you joined us, Susie. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. I mean, there's just so much to, to cover um, in all aspects of safety of our business and for our clients as well. And I think it's just my parting, parting words would just be trust your intuition, try to vet your clients um, using the different resources. Um, what was, there was another resource I had here going on public, um, publicdata.com. Oh, verifying addresses. If you get a listing, somebody wants to meet you somewhere or just kind of know where you're going. Um, and the other one, the truepeoplesearch.com. Type in an address, type in a phone number. Those are free. If you want to check their criminal background, yeah, I think there's a fee for that. But um, you know, there's then, some initial sources. I'm going I'm to say something about those criminal background check things. We were um, looking at an app that, you, you know, it was supposed to be a security app that said you can put this person's information in and then find out, you know, if, if it's who they say they are and if they have a criminal record or, you know, bankruptcies or whatever. So, you know what you're dealing with. So I put in my own name and it said I had a criminal record. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> must have been one of those other two leases. <laughs> uh, I, you know what it was? It was, I didn't, I was behind on my tags by a couple of months and I lost my DM, the DMV thing never came in and I got a ticket for not having. And that showed up? Yes. So take some of the things that you see on these things with a grain of salt, because it's just, you know, if somebody has had a, a traffic violation, if, you know, and I, I checked a few people and then I, I, and it's like, that person would never have had it. And then you go on public records and see that it was a, you know, court case for a, a traffic accident or something like that, just stupid mm. stuff. And, you know, I was really, you know, I shot it down because it's like the same. I'm a criminal because I didn't have my car registered for us. Well, I think a lot for an, an first initial is just check the phone number and the name that it is John Smith and not Tim Jones. You know, who whoever is calling you, that phone number matches the name. I mean, mine, you put my phone number, I think you're going to find Robert Soto. <laughs> I don't know if you, it'll come to my name, but at least there's a, that connection right there. My, you know the name shows up in there so it's um you know it's been just some little staying safe um minimize your clients information i always tell my clients i don't need it your lender needs it escrow needs it i i just need the bare minimum because should my system get hacked i don't want to be responsible for that um, exactly last thing we need is social security numbers there is nothing no. that a real estate agent can do with the social security number. Nope. So we don't nope. need those. I don't need that. But I mean, it, it's September's Realtor Safety Month. Um, you know, fall realtors just take these steps every day. It keeps the awareness every day. Your COVID safety that you're taking, your wipes, your gloves, your, your slippers, your sprays, um, take that same due diligence into vetting your clients um, before you see them. And, and just remember, it's a lot of 90% of somebody that you know. Um, and it's, it doesn't mean they're, it's acquaintance. It's um, someone you, you may have met, but you put your guard down because it's, oh, I feel safe with this because of in the microwave. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, we're a few minutes over anyhow. So I think you have things to do. And you know, my gardener's here and they're making a heck of a lot of noise. So I'm really sorry. You got the dog, you got the gardeners, you know, hey, this is life, right? This is, this Birthday is boys. That's right. But yeah, Susie, but it was so great to have you. Anytime I can spend time you. with you. Oh, I just love it. Oh, so, same here. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. And if you have any questions or whatever, put in the comments. And Susie, if you have any links that come to you later, just hop on Facebook, throw them in the comments so everybody can retrieve them. 
And we thank you all for joining us today. Go out and sell a house. Okay, see you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.